Hello, this is Team Magmafant. We have been designing a game called Game of Flails. It's a war game about Gutsu War, a peasant uprising in Finland in 1596 to 1597. The name of the game is based on Gutsu. This was the most common weapon used by the peasants during the uprising. And the name Game of Flails is based on the idea that the flail was actually uh, the most effective weapon during the war. The basic premise of the game is that uh, the Finnish peasants were uh, pretty much worried about increasing taxes and war weariness caused by the uh, presence of the uh, Swedish army commanded in Finland by Klaus Fleming. The background is, is set in Finland, but it's connected to wider uh, conflict between uh, Karle Hertua Duke Charles, who later became King of Sweden, and the current King of Sweden and Poland, King Sigismund. Uh, the game is based on all bridges burning. We have used the basic components from the game, the wooden pieces, the dice, and the map. <coughs> what we have created are two decks of cards, one historical narrative deck that drives the story forward, and uh, action deck that is going to be used to resolve actions during game turns. The card-based system is somewhat based to Twilight Struggle and Labyrinth, but we have also modified it to fit uh, in the three-player setting. Also, we are using action system based to the coin system, but we uh, decided to modify the combat to make it more chaotic to fit the theme and fit the time period. So we drew some influence from War of the Ring and created this kind of dice-based uh, combat system with leaders as well. Uh, that being said, uh, I have the map set in front of me. It might be a bit difficult to see, but uh, we have the different factions set up. Uh, this is based on a scenario that is happening when the war actually starts. In the beginning, <coughs> we have this deck of 10 cards. The first couple of turns might be pre-war setting, and then the war kicks in. There are two phases in the war, and this deck drives the story forward and creates the narrative. So it's uh, kind of historical, but then sandbox-like that you can uh, do different kind of things, but the whole story still follows the historical events. The red pieces are the peasants. They are kind of a guerrilla faction. They might go underground, create ambushes, ride uh, mansions that are owned by the nobility, the blue pieces. The nobility is kind of tricky faction. They are passive, they are not strong in arms, but they can manipulate both the army and the peasants. They can choose their side, and they actually have to choose their side to be able to succeed in the game. Also, we have the army. The, uh, actually, this is black piece, but we are going to use the white pieces from the game, but we didn't have the physical components at hand. Also, the army has cannons and cavalry, which are way more powerful than anything that the peasants might have. Uh, also, we have modified the map with overlays. We have kept only two cities, Viipuri and Turku, which were prominent at the time being, and erased all of the other cities. Instead, we have fortresses, castles, that were all over the place, and they have a huge role in how army can manage their campaigns because they have to maintain upkeep. Uh, one of the core components, also in the background story, are these uh, discs. They are going to be um, cardboard tokens, actually. These are garrisons, or Linnaleiri in Finnish. They were maintained by the uh, nobility, but the actual support, the supplies, came from the peasants. And that was one of the main drivers for the peasants to revolt in the first place. Uh, this is kind of a tricky component, because the army, if they are residing in a region that has Linnaleiri, the nobility must pay for their upkeep. But if the army is not within a region, for example, if the peasants have raided these Linnaleiris, these garrisons, and destroyed them, then the army must maintain itself. And this creates this kind of balance between the nobility Nobility, uh, uh, the peasants and the army, they are tied together, they might be enemies, but they can be allies in, in kind of an easy way. 
Also, there are these uh, mansions. They are going to be cardboard tokens as well. When they are not uh, raided, they will generate steady supply of uh, resources to the uh, nobility. When they are raided, they give one time uh, bonus of resources to peasants, but then again, they will never ever produce anything again. And this was the historical event. The peasants raided the uh, mansions to have uh, supplies for the war and also out of frustration they wanted revenge and kind of justice. Uh, each of the factions have their own goals. For example, the peasants, they are aggressive faction. They want to win the war quickly because they, they run out of steam eventually. They, they are large in number, but uh, they are not very strong. They have moral track that is uh, influenced by events and also the casualties they take. With, with moral, high morale, they are quite kind of effective, but when the morale declines, they uh, quickly become cannon fodder. And if the morale ever reaches zero, they're out of the game and the military, the army, wins the game. The army, on the other hand, they want to crush the rebellion fast, but also they are dependent on their support from the nobles. And the nobles themselves want to manipulate the game. They have the power to uh, decide early end to the game. It's kind of tricky to pull off, but possible. And also, in the map we have system so that we can uh, mark uh, support, regional support. Kind of like in Twilight Struggle, for example. It can have opposition or support for Sigismund. And, and the uh, nobles are best in influencing this support, and they win the game if neither faction the peasants or the uh, army has strong enough support or opposition. And they're good at this manipulation game. Peasants and the army, on the other hand, they rely on brute force. Also, we have leaders. They are historically uh, created. They are based on real characters. This is early prototype. They are going to be cardboard tokens with their uh, actual uh, illustrations of the leaders. They are mostly used in combat, but also we have used this Prisoners of War box so that it was kind of bloody conflict typically when the uh, opposing forces captured the leaders, they executed them. For example, the uh, peasants used uh, kind of spears to put people under ice in water to drown them. And due to superstition, they didn't want to shed blood. And, and uh, the war itself is it's full of uh, trickery and deceit, and we tried to capture it, this in the game. Um, we had a couple of playthroughs. It takes approximately three hours to play, but it can uh, end way more quickly if the sudden death takes place. In the couple of games, uh, it, it lasted only like, like one hour. So it's a combination of different kind of mechanics. Coin series, of, of course, is is a heavy influencer, but also we wanted to. Uh, kind of create new kind of feeling and different kind of experience so we uh, created this kind of card play that you have a uh, hand of cards and you play them similarly to Twilight Struggle and Labyrinth and also the cards can be used in, in um, combat like in War of the Ring and the dice system itself is similar to War of the Ring also the cards are the currency of the game you need to purchase them and each card in hand represents a turn that you can take during the round so if you want to save your uh, supplies, your resources to later time, you will have to compromise how many turns you are going to take. It's an uh, early prototype, experimental, but we are quite happy with the results. Uh, it's playable, it's kind of tense. Every, every faction has taken victory in the uh, playtesting. And yeah, that will be all. Remember, this is a gut show.